The correct meaning of the sacred text, Thou art that, as given by the sage, is recorded in the Guru Ramana Vachanamala, when he states, Thou art not the body, nor the senses, nor the mind, nor the vital force, nor the ego. Thou art that which will shine as the pure I am, when by the renunciation of the original sin, which is just the notion of individual selfhood in these, and by the quest of the real self, the mind is utterly extinguished in the heart, and the world ceases to be seen. The sage tells us that the original sin, which is referred to in the Christian doctrine, is no other than the ego sense. Incidentally, it may be noted that the ego itself is the cause of all that, that vehemence of belief which engenders fanaticism and intolerance and a taste for vain and even rancorous controversies. The religious man is ego-ridden, just like his more agreeable brother, the skeptic. The latter is indifferent and therefore not disagreeable. But the religious man is rarely at ease, especially the scholarly type, because he sees so many people believing differently from himself. He ardently looks forward to a time when all men shall be of one religion, but he cannot bear to think that that religion shall be in the least different from his own. He would rather that other people should be without any religion than that they should cherish a religion not his own. Hence, it happens that the more intensely religious a man is, the more unpleasant he is likely to be to those who differ from him in religion. If he obtains political power, he will persecute all that profess other religions. That is because religious belief is not inimical to egoism. The religious man always thinks that his zeal for making converts is a virtue. It is not a virtue at all, but a vice, because this zeal is due to egoism. He does not say to himself, This faith seems to be true and good, so it shall be mine till I know better. But, on, but instead, he says to himself in a contrary way, this is my faith, and therefore it alone is true, and it is the duty of all men to accept it. Thus his attachment to his own faith is egoistic. That is why there is a rancor in his condemnation of other faiths. The existence of those faiths is an insult to him. He seems to say orthodoxy is my doxy, and heterodoxy is the other man's doxy. Thus it happens that many a believer harbors a greater dislike for those that differ from him slightly than even for non-believers, or for believers in a totally different religion. This is pointed out by the sage in the following words. He that has not attained the state of perfect identity with reality, which is his natural state, since that reality is ever shining in the hearts of all creatures as the real self, by seeking and becoming aware of it, engages in controversies, asserting there is something real. No, that something has form. No, it is one. It is twofold. It is neither. From this we understand that the sage has no creed of his own, and the reason is that he is egoless. The ego is itself the believer or unbeliever, as the case may be. The ego-ridden ones are divided into two broad divisions, those that deny and those that assert the existence of a reality underlying the changing phases of the world, 
including therein the threefold appearance, namely the soul, the sense objects, and God. The asserters again fall into numerous subdivisions because they differ as to the nature of that reality. The main differences are mentioned here. In the first place, there is conflict of beliefs about the reality of form. There are those who assert that the first cause has form. Naturally, this is denied by some. Then there is the controversy about the unity or diversity of that cause. Some assert that the first cause is one and that the universe is an appearance in it so that it is both the material and the efficient cause. Others deny this and assert that the first cause is God, who is eternally distinct from the souls. There are still others who maintain that God and the souls are neither identical nor distinct. Among these, the believers in unity are also mentioned, because that teaching, though true enough, is not intended to be cherished as a mere dogma, but as an incentive to the attainment of actual experience of reality. Those that are averse to the quest by which the experience is to be won are therefore no better than the others. All are equally subject to the ego and content to remain so. But in truth, only direct experience of the self is real, not beliefs about it, which imply that the self can become an object of thought. Mere theoretical knowledge of the self, even that derived from the sacred lore, is ignorance, just like the dogmas of the devotees. What the sage means is that reality transcends the mind, while creeds are purely mental. Therefore, no creed can be a faithful description of reality. Reality is neither in the creeds nor in the books in which they are set forth. The believer is just the ego, whose nature is to hide or distort the truth, saying, I believe. To him the sage says, Find out the truth of this I, the believer. Then thou wilt know the truth that transcends the mind, and therefore cannot be contained in a creed or religion. We thus see that the ego is the primal seed of all this manifoldness, not only of the world of objects, but also of the world of ideas. This is a logical extension of the conclusion that we have arrived at in the last chapter, namely that the world is mental. Since the mind has no existence apart from the ego, it follows that the ego itself is both the mind and the world. This is just what the sage says in the, when he tells us the following. When the ego rises, then all the world comes into being. When the ego is not, then nothing exists. Therefore, the quest of the self, by way of the question, who is this ego, or whence does he, this ego come into being, is the means of getting rid of all of the world. The teaching conveyed here should be considered along with that conveyed in another passage quoted in the last chapter. There the sage told us that the plurality of selves appearing to us in ignorance is an illusion, and that this plurality would cease to be seen when the ego is extinguished by the quest. Thus we get the result that in the state of deliverance or self-realization, there is no world whether of things and persons, or of thoughts, that the whole world is in the ego and is nothing but the ego.